what's it like to be here today, you know, 50 years from when you wrote Carry On Sergeant? Gobsmack. It's astounding. It's amazing. I think you could say it's unprecedented that a string of funny little British films could engender this kind of, I don't want to say hysteria, but such enthusiasm and above all, affection. That's not a quality or a sentiment you usually associate with show business, except when it's doing it deliberately in tear-jerking tear fashion. Karen Peterson, who is the librarian of the Writers Guild of America, has on record as classifying the carry-ons have now moved from a cult into a full-blown phenomenon. So that's what I represent here, a full-blown phenomenon. And, and tell me, when you wrote Carry On Sergeant, did you have any idea it would be such a massive franchise? No, not at all. I wasn't even sure it would be a success as a film. It was one job amongst many. But, uh, no, but I wasn't doing million, dozens of shows at the same time, but I was working fairly steadily, one film or TV show after another, and uh, I was paid for it, and that was that. And then when it, when it hit that big, it was the dream of, it, it's the dream of everybody who goes for an audition, that you're going to get the part, and this is what it amounted to. What sort of humour were you locking into? What were you, what were you writing about? I was writing about the topic, nursing or teaching or police or whatever, but the type of humour I was writing was mine. If I, there was, I've quoted this many times, so I hope most of your listeners or viewers, whoever, um, haven't heard it before. But I think it affects a lot of people, not just me. There was once a jazz musician called Mez Mesro, and he was so dedicated to his craft that he even changed his race on his passport, race Negro. He wanted to be like a black man with such rhythm and history of rhythm. And he dictated his memoirs. He wasn't the writer. And it's all done in very, in those days, very hip language. When the book came out and he was given it to read, somebody like you asked him, well, Mr. Mesro, what do you think of your book now that it's in print? He said, well, I can only tell you, all we thought we were doing was playing the music that we liked. Now I find out that was significant. And that's all we did. We wrote, wrote and produced and acted so the funniest film we could by our own lights. We were prepared for the death by silence, which all comedians and comedy writers fear. But we were rewarded with worldwide roars of laughter. I, I tell you, outside of sex, there's no feeling, no feeling like thousand people laughing at something you wrote. And do you think that humour is relevant today? Well, they're still showing them on TV. I presume still, people are still laughing at them. They are still being sold on DVDs. And I hope people are ch at least chuckling at home. So I guess it does last, yes. I'm not comparing myself with Shakespeare, but, uh, you know, The Merry Wives of Windsor is still a funny play. It was written 400 years ago. What is it about this saucy seaside postcard humour? Because it doesn't, doesn't hurt anybody. Hattie Jake said it to me once. I was writing a show for her in the series called Our House. She said, look, what I want to do, Hat, is to do a show where you try to decide to lose weight. And she lives in a house with a lot of other people. And to encourage her, all the others try to lose weight too. They all go on diets. The fun is in the middle of the night, they're all creeping around the house trying to find donuts to eat, you know, so, so okay. She said, doesn't matter, Norman, so long as it's funny and gentle. And that's what I think our, our shows were. They, they appeared to be raucous and even uh, Rabelaisian from time to time. But in fact, it was all quite gentle humour. What do you think about those people that say that they're vulgar, they're rude, a statement against women? It's a free country. They can say what they like. It's been a delight to talk to you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you very much.